In this section, we'll examine block diagrams and show how to simplify them into various versions, including one version with a single block. In our seven steps for controller design, block diagrams are involved in step one, deriving the model, and step four, determining what can be controlled and how. Let's consider an airplane example. The pilot moves the stick. For a fly-by-wire system, that movement results in a voltage that is sent to an actuator. The stick is a dynamic block, since forces and deflections from the pilot need to be measured and processed. Measurement and processing takes a finite amount of time, which causes a small delay in the system. We have to model that mathematically with a differential equation. The actuator can be hydraulic or electric. It's the device that moves the airplane's elevator, rudder, or ailerons. Actuator movement is not instantaneous. The rod takes a finite amount of time to travel a linear distance. So the actuator block is another dynamic system modeled by a differential equation. The airplane responds dynamically to elevator, rudder, or aileron movements. The airplane is considered the main system or the plant and is modeled with one or more differential equations. Next, we need to choose what will be fed back into the flight control system. There are many different output parameters to choose from. Pitch attitude, pitch rate, elevator position, angle of attack, load factor, etc. For this example, We'll feed back pitch rate. Pitch rate is given by the symbol Q. So we need to grab pitch rate from a takeoff point or a branch. Pitch rate is measured and thus has dynamics. Also, it's in different units than volts. So there's a measurement slash unit conversion block for pitch rate in the feedback path. By feeding back pitch rate, we essentially make the pilot stick a pitch rate command system. The actuator only needs to see a voltage when the airplane response doesn't match the pilot's command. Therefore, a summing point or a summer is in the block diagram to basically show the overall system error. That is why the feedback path is subtracted from the command path. Just because block diagrams are wired together with solid lines doesn't mean a physical connection exists in the actual system. For example, pitch rate is measured with a rate gyro that can be installed anywhere on the aircraft. The output just needs to be sent to the flight control computer. So why do we use feedback control? First, it can make a airplane handle or fly better. Second, we can enable autonomous operations. Self-driving cars is the big deal right now. Autopilots with auto landing capabilities have been around for a while. The two-dimensional self-driving car effort is actually a lot more challenging than the three-dimensional auto land. Third, stabilize an unstable system. For example, the F-16 is unstable without its control system. Fourth, suppress unwanted inputs and disturbances. These include wind gusts, turbulence, or in the case of cars, potholes, etc. And finally, suppress the effects of unknown variations in the system dynamics. How accurately did we model our system? If we linearized it, what were the impacts? We showed this general feedback control system on the first day of class. We want the plant to respond to both a reference input R and a control output C. The error signal is sent to the controller or compensator in the forward path. We may or may not have a sensor block in the feedback path. Sometimes you'll assume a perfect sensor, so the H block would be one 
or simply not there. Each block will be named or the function shown inside of it. When we grab a signal to feed back, a branch is formed. We assume nothing is lost from branching a signal. In other words, Y comes out of the block, Y is the overall system output, and Y is the feedback signal. Summing points or junctions can be represented a number of ways. If no mathematical symbol is present, we assume it's positive. However, sometimes a plus sign is used. The X in the circle may or may not be shown. The plus and minus signs may be inside or outside the circles. It really depends on the book or the organizational standards. Back to our general model. The compensator and plant blocks are in series and thus can be multiplied together to form one block called G. That is the forward transfer function. As we follow the arrows around the block, we notice a loop that contains the forward block G and the feedback block H. The product of G and H is called the open loop transfer function. We'll see why in a minute. The system output over the system input, or C divided by R, is called the closed loop transfer function. The denominator of the closed loop transfer function is called the characteristic polynomial. If we replace g sub c times g sub p with just g, we have what's called the canonical form. To get the closed loop transfer function, which is defined as the overall system output C divided by the overall system input R, we need to do some block diagram algebra. I like to use small letters to label all the wires in the diagram. I typically start at the wire coming out of the summing point and continue around the diagram until every wire is labeled. Next, look backwards at each wire and write down the function that created it. We'll start with A. A equals big R minus C. B equals G times A, but I can substitute for A. So B equals G times big R minus G times C. Little c equals H times B. After substituting for B, we get little c equals h times g times r minus h times g times little c. We have a little c on both sides of this equation, so we need to solve for it. We get little c equals h times g times r divided by 1 plus hg. Now at this point, we need to remember what the heck our goal was. It was to generate the closed loop transfer function, which is big C divided by big R. So what is big C? It's the same as the little b signal. So I can use the equation for little b and substitute big C for little b. Notice that the equation also has a little c in it. I can substitute what we derived for the little c, namely hg r divided by 1 plus hg. Now all the little letters are gone, and I'm left with an equation in terms of big C, g, h, and r. Now determine big C over r. For this canonical form block diagram, the closed loop transfer function is g over 1 plus gh. I can now replace this entire block diagram with one block, the closed loop transfer function.
Previously, we defined the open loop transfer function as g times h. So how did we get that? To help visualize how, imagine taking scissors and cutting or opening the loop just prior to the summing point. If you then grab the loose end and strung it out, you can see the open loop system is g times h. So you would need to change the name of the output since it's no longer a controlled output. So renaming it to something like y. And then you can also drop the summing point since nothing is added. We covered the canonical form. There's another popular form called the cascade form. It has two blocks in the forward path and unity feedback, that is, no blocks in the feedback path. Convince yourself that the open loop transfer function is gh. Use block diagram algebra to convince yourself that the closed loop transfer function is gh over 1 plus gh. Let's now compare canonical to cascade systems. First, the open loop transfer functions are exactly the same gh. Also, the denominators of the closed loop transfer functions, defined as the characteristic polynomials, are also the same. The only difference is the numerator of the closed loop transfer functions. Cascade has an h multiplying g. We'll see that these two models will have the exact same stability characteristics and only the outputs will be different. Many analysis and design methods expect either the cascade or the canonical form of the system. We'll soon see what MATLAB expects. However, lots of systems are not that simple and you may not be able to get those forms. Here's the F16 block diagram for an example of a complex system that you can't get into either cascade or canonical form. Let's work through another block diagram algebra example. Again, start with little a and work your way around the block diagram. Anytime you get a variable on both sides of the equation, you have to solve for it. And don't lose sight of the goal. We're finding the closed loop transfer function, big C over big R. Little a from the block diagram equals big R minus I. Little b equals G1 times little a, and I can substitute for little a. Little c equals little b minus g, and the expression is shown there. Little d equals little c minus h3 times i. Little e equals h1 times d, and I can substitute for d above. Little f equals g2 times d, again I can substitute for d. Little g equals h2 times f, and when I substitute for f, I realize that there's a little g now on both sides of the equation. So I need to solve for little g. After some algebra and simplification, there's the expression for little g. Little h equals little e plus little f. For this, we have to get common denominator and then simplify. 
So there's the simplified expression for little h. Many of the elements or terms canceled. Little i equals g3 times little h. We see that there's an i on both sides of the equation, so we need to solve for it. Solving for i, we get the equation shown. But remember what the big picture is. We're looking for big C over big R. And we know now from the block diagram that little i is the same as big C. So big C over big R is nothing more than little i over big R. And that right there in the closed box is the closed loop transfer function. In the next module, we'll demonstrate how to build transfer functions in MATLAB.